Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So we are so happy to have everyone here this morning. Um, we've had two wonderful days together. Um, I have been very, very, very uh, pleased at what we've been able to enjoy together at our tour around San Francisco. Um, I do apologize for your stay at naturalization during the four and a half hours you were at the airport. But uh, we're really glad that we're here this morning. We're really looking forward to uh, the next three days. And this morning, we would like to start off um, by having some words of welcome and introduction from our two city council members and Mayor of Crescent City, Blake Inscore and Heidi Keim. Heidi's closer, so Heidi will go first. Okay. okay. Thank you, Jeff. Oh, hi, Ogazaimas. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to see you all and welcome you to Crescent City. After living um, in Aomori, I want you all to know I had three years of learning to fall in love with Japan. Uh, first, it was Japanese culture, Japanese food, vending machines. <laughs> Royal milk tea, hot, in a can, any time you need it. Genius, pure genius. The beauty of Mount Hakoda, onsens, and yes, <laughs> love the onsens. And many Tohoku uh, adventures. I, I, love, I love Japan. Uh, I mostly fell in love with uh, Nihonjin. I love Japanese people. You fill my heart. And I feel so honored to have you join us here again, some of you here again. I knew traveling to Rikuzen Takeda would be great. When I, when I did it for the first time uh, in 2017, we, uh, we were the first trip to go. I knew it would be great based on my, my previous knowledge. But you have far surpassed any of my expectations, and this has gone way beyond my wildest dreams. So thank you, welcome. I hope you enjoy the next three days. We've been very, very busy. <laughs> and we have a lot of things planned for you. Arigatou gozaimasu. Yeah. Ohayou gozaimasu. Uh, welcome to Crescent City. We are so excited to have you here with us this week. This has been a exciting time to see our two communities grow together. Uh, this began as uh, an act of kindness of some high school students here in Del Norte County who thought that sending Kamome back would be a good thing. Not only was it a good thing, it was a great thing because you are here today because of those students because of their willingness to say, we want to do something for someone else. I'm very thankful uh, for the commitment that, was been, that has been made over the last several years, and you are a part of that. Uh, we do not presume to be the experts in anything here. We simply want to share with you what we have learned, and in turn, we want to learn from you because together we are better. This relationship will go on long past any of us. We do this not for us. We do this for our children. For you who are educators, thank you for your commitment to see the future for your children and for our children. And I look forward to how this relationship will grow many years beyond all of us. Thank you and welcome. Arigato gozaimasu. And at this point, we would all like to introduce the head of the delegation from Rikuzen Takeda, Hamako Sato, principal of Yahagi Elementary School. Thanks. 
日本語で失礼します。皆さんおはようございます。Good morning, everyone。私はこの度のこのグループの代表として一言ご挨拶させていただきます。As the, uh, representing the entire group here, I would like to say a few words this morning. 昨日はとても心温かく、そして熱烈に私たちをお迎えいただいて、本当にありがとうございました。Yes, とても嬉しかったです。Yes, today you welcomed us so warmly at the airport. I was, we were very happy to see everyone. Thank you so much. そしてこのような研修の機会をご用意いただいて、とてもあの楽しみにしています。とても嬉しいです。And、uh, this week we have this exciting、uh, training session、uh, ahead of us, and we're looking forward to it very much. Today, we have very much looking forward to the next three days、uh, so that we can learn a lot, and、uh, we know、uh, that. Um, what we're going to learn this week is going to be very important for us as well as to take home. Looking forward to the next three days. Thank you. And at this time, I would like to introduce the Consul General. Of the Consulate General of Japan in San Francisco, Domochika Uyama. San Francisco, s o r i o g e n o Uyama to Moshimas, Tahen, Toitoko, Oscar Sama de Gozaimas. Saison, Jupon, I must have to read on the ちょっと長くなりますが最初に英語で話をしますけどその後あの日本語で同じことをあのお話しいたします。うん、Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tomochika Uyama, the Consul General of Japan in San Francisco. Thank you very much for having me and my colleague here today. First of all, I'd like to thank Mayor Inskor and Supervisor Howard for their incredible leadership in their relation with the Xen Takata. They have represented Crescent City and Del Norte County extremely well, and I have the privilege of working with them for the past nearly two years. Thank you for being the face of this amazing relationship.、Uh, next, I'd like to thank Superintendent Jeff Harris、uh, for his management of the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo grant that made this whole visit possible. I understand there was an enormous amount of work, so I'm very grateful for the remarkable efforts. You and your staff. Thank you very much. I'd also like to recognize、uh, Mayor Pro Tem Heidi Kaim,、um, uh, Board of Supervisors Chairs、uh, Lori Cohen, and School Board President Frank、uh, Macarino、uh, for their presence and great effort、uh, for these programs. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the Rikuzen Takata delegation. Uh, for joining a long way to take part in this wonderful opportunity for an exchange of best practices and deeper development of friendship. I know everyone here has many other responsibilities, so thank you for going above and beyond、uh, <clears throat> the call of duty by giving this visit your generous time and attention. The consulate sincerely appreciates the opportunity to participate in the act activities of sister cities. And to help strengthen、uh, the relationship between our communities and our cultures and our countries. As you well know, sister cities form the basis for strong grassroots relations that encourage international cultural exchanges and help build personal bonds. They demonstrate the significance of people to people and community to community exchanges. Student exchange programs, in particular, Significantly impact the lives of youth by fostering globally educated and engaged citizens, thereby securing a better future for the next generation. Your student exchange program's origin story is a particularly inspiring one. Actually, the students really initiated them, and it deserves to be known by everyone involved in the Japan US relationship. 
Since 1957, over 100 sister and friendship city relationships have been established between cities in Japan and the state of California alone. This number is about a quarter of the grand total for all U.S.-Japan sister city relationships. Northern California alone boasts 65 of these relationships, and many of them are recognized to be among the oldest uh, in the country. However, as one of the youngest sister city relationships in the country, Crescent City, Del Norte County, and Rickson Takata have demonstrated that longevity is not the only measure of quality. In fact, this relationship is unprecedented in many ways and sets a bar quite high for the other 440 relationships between Japan and the United States. As a government diplomat, I'm here to thank you, uh, the citizen diplomats who outnumber us by quite a bit. In citizen diplomacy, there's a great power generated by creating and maintaining personal connections that contribute to improving the lives of the residents of each of your communities. I understand you'll be discussing ideas to empower women in the community by maximizing their participation and leadership across all sectors. And in another track, you'll discuss inclusionary practices in schools for special needs children for developing responses for children exhibiting academic or behavioral issues and for those students dealing with trauma or other often overlooked mental health issues. Overcoming these challenges in both of your communities is crucial to the well-being and strengthen, strength of your citizens. And I find it highly motivating that all of you are here to learn from each other on these topics with open minds and open hearts. The Japanese word kakehashi <coughs> means a bridge that connects two places. All of you are now kakehashi uh, between our two <coughs> cultures, so please do your best as human bridges. As we develop and maintain ties between communities in our two countries, as we achieve mutual understanding and expand our cultural horizons, we're offering models not only for our local areas, but on a larger level for Japan and the United States to work together and prosper together in peace. The Japanese consulate is proud to be involved in promoting <coughs> these sister city relationships and we hope to continue to play a supportive role in the future. Thank you very much once again for allowing me to attend your gathering today. I wish all a productive and enjoyable visit. Now I'm uh, saying in Japanese. え、本日はお招きに預かりまして大変ありがとうございます。このオーバーをお借りしましてまず初めにリクゼンタカタ氏との交流において力強いリーダーシップを発揮してこられたインスコア市長さん、それからハワード軍議会議員感謝申し上げ
未来を切り開くものであるというふうに思っております。皆様が学生交流を始められたきっかけは大変感動的なものであり、日米関係に携わるすべての人が知るべきであるというふうに思っております。1957年から日本とカリフォルニア州との間の姉妹都市が生まれましたけれども、今、100以上のです、ね、姉妹都市関係が構築されております。サンフランシスコは北のカリフォルニアを管轄しておりますけれども、これだけでも65の姉妹都市がございまして、その多くが日米間の姉妹都市関係の中でも、最も長い歴史を持つものになっております。もう50年、60年といった歴史がございます。しかしながら、その交流の歴史の長さも重要ですけれども、この陸前高田市とクレセントシティ、デルノーデ郡との関係を見ますと、長さだけが重要ではないということがよく分かります。皆様方の取り組まれておられる交流は、本当に前例のないものでございまして、昨日の空港の出迎えがそれを象徴しておりますけれども、こうしたことは日米間の他の440の姉妹都市に大きな影響をすでに与えておるということを申し上げたいと思います。本日は市民外交に取り組まれている市民外交官の皆様に感謝を申し上げるためにここに参りました。市民外交には人と人の関係をベースにコミュニティの人間同士がですね、お互いに豊かになるために努力すると、そういう大きな力があるというふうに思っております。今回はコミュニティにおける女性の活躍、あるいは学校生活において支援が必要な生徒のための包括的な取り組みについて、意見交換がなされるというふうに伺っております。両地域のコミュニティが抱えるこうした課題を克服することは、人々の幸福にとって重要でありまして、皆様方は互いに胸襟を開いて学び合うためにここに来られたというふうに思っております。先ほど日本語の架け橋の意味を英語でちょっと説明をしましたけれども、まさに皆様方が日米間の架け橋でいらっしゃるとこういうふうに思っております。両地域間のコミュニティの絆が強くなり、相互理解が進み、より広範な交流に至るということで、地域同士だけではなく、日米間というより大きなレベルにおいても、共に取り組み、共に平和を育む模範を皆様方が示されておられるというふうに思っております。えー、総領事館といたしましても、こうした活動に参加できることを誇りに思うとともに、引き続き、えー、支援をさせていただきたいと、このように考えております。改めまして本日はお招,きお招きいただきましてありがとうございました。この度の訪問が実り大きいものとなりますように、えー、記念しております。どうもありがとうございます。And Supervisor Cowan to come welcome our group. Come on down, Chris. Good morning. Welcome to Crescent City, Del Norte County. First, I want to say thank you for letting me share the day with you on Saturday in San Francisco, and for many of you, your first time in the United States. It was a pleasure just to hang out and get to know you. And, and、um, I'm so excited that you have arrived in our community and that we can share it with you. Just like you shared it with me when I was in r i k a z a n t a k a d a in 2018. Over the next couple of days or three days that you're here, I hope you、um, see the similarities, the same similarities that I saw between our two communities are quite a bit alike. And I hope that you are able to take. Things home to share with your, with your community just like we did and、uh, the exchange. I'm so grateful for this friendship and for me to watch how it has grown over the seven years has been very much、uh, heartwarming.、Uh, from the first day when the boat arrived here on the shores of Crescent City and the students that got involved were students that were very close to my heart. They were kids that were friends with my kids and children that grew up in my home. So, It was、uh, a pleasure for me to be part of that and watch these children take that initiative because this is how it all started was with the kids. They are the ones who saw the vision of what they can do 
and I remember their first trip over like it was yesterday. And um, from that, you know, here we are seven years later. And every time it's a new experience. And um, I, I came back um, last night saying, oh, you're going to love this group. It's, they're great. We love them. You know, you guys have been so wonderful and so welcoming. And I'm so glad you're here. And I really, really hope that you enjoy the next three days and what we have planned for you. Thank you. Good morning. In July 2019, Rikizatakata was accepted as a model city by the United Nations for Sustainable Development. We wear this symbol to remind us of that. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015, provides a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. At the heart are the 17 sustainable development goals, which are an urgent call for action for all countries developed and developing in a global partnership. They recognize the ending of poverty and other deprivations must go hand in hand with strategies that improve health and education, reduce inequality, and spur economic growth. Komome became a symbol of hope for our communities when she began her journey across the Pacific. Komomi found our children for a reason. And as children are a symbol of hope for our future, and it is that symbol of hope that Komomi provides not only to be shared with our communities, not only to be shared with those that struggle with inequities and disabilities, Komome is our boat of hope. And it is our conversation to share with the world. We, Rikas and Takata and Del Norte County and Crescent City, will be that model for our future shared vision. Thank you. And at this time, I would like to invite the president of the Del Norte Board of Education, Frank Magarino. Good morning. Um, yeah, seven years ago, this uh, Kamami landed on our shores, and I was giving it some thought and thinking about it for a while. And I said to myself, is this um, just a stroke of luck, just a happenstate that this boat just landed on our shores, meandering in the Pacific Ocean for two years? Or is it Providence? Yeah. I believe it's Providence. And then we had um, Bill Stevens over there. Was sitting there watching his beloved Giants. That's a baseball team, in case you don't know. And he had an epiphany. He says, yeah, let's return that boat. Let's return it like it left Japan. Nice and clean, fix it up. And that just started a relationship. And it blossomed. That's Providence. And as time went on, the relationship became stronger. Then we went from one city to another, back and forth. I think it's what, 10 visits that we've had between the two? Yeah. That's amazing. And we've learned a great deal from each other. And we continue to learn from each other. And right now we're 
you folks have brought it to the point that it's become an international incident, an international wonder. That's providence. And if we continue on this path, imagine what we can accomplish. Like Mr. Howard said, conversations about poverty, inequality, and yes, climate change. I believe this is providence. I believe we can do this. And I hope and pray that those who follow us will continue with the mantle. Thank you very much. So as we move into the next three days, um, let's explore a little bit, not only for us, but for everyone else in the room and for those who may be seeing this later. Um, over the next three days, we have a really unique opportunity to explore ideas, to talk about um, those things, again, that, that Supervisor Howard brought forward, where he talked about health and education being at the core. And as the school superintendent, I have to go back to education being at the core, because without strongly educating our youth, good quality health care, employment, jobs, international relations, and even solid, stable families are very difficult to maintain. So over the next three days, um, we will be exploring the idea of empowering resilient schools. So I would like to you know, welcome about half of the group will be joining us for resilient schools. We'll be talking about multi-tiered systems of support. How do we ensure that every child has what they need, both academically and social emotionally? Um, and we'll share our struggles. Uh, like Blake said, we don't have the answers. Um, we have, the more we learn, the more questions we have. And we're hoping that we can learn together because I have to tell you, on my visit to Rakuzen Takeda in June, we saw some amazing, amazing work being done in discussing resiliency with students, on providing resilient community-based engagement with kids in the classroom. And it was amazing work. And we left going, wow, I wish we could do that. So over the next three days, we want to explore that. The other track is going to be empowering resilient women. As you look around this room, we have strong women leaders who are joining us from Japan, who are joining us from around Crescent City and Del Norte County, and from our tribal governments. It is going to be an amazing opportunity to discuss what does it look like to engage at every level, in every facet of a community to empower women, and most especially, and again, this is my bias from education, to empower young girls, to envision what that would look like to become that leader, that role model, that person who carries that torch forward, who builds my community, who builds your community, who takes our cities, our areas, our communities, and pushes them far beyond anything we could imagine now. You know, there's, there's a saying, we're educating students for jobs we don't know will exist. We're actually educating students for societies that we hope will exist. And I think that is, that's my goal as we go through this week, is to really talk about how to create resilient school systems you know, we, we know of the tragedy of Rakuzen Takeda, but we also know that through conversations at Fumonji, through conversations in the schools, through conversations at City Hall, that the resiliency of the community is the key to the future. Our resiliency through generational trauma, our resiliency through economic loss, 
our resiliency. Many of our students exhibit some of the highest levels of trauma and abuse and neglect in the state of California. So addressing those issues, helping to build the community that we want to see, I think is the heart of what we all, we all do every day. And this week we'll be able to explore that and learn from one another. And hopefully by the time Thursday morning rolls around, we will all walk out with a better plan and idea of what we want and some ideas of how to get there. So I am very, very excited um, as we move ahead. Uh, as I said earlier, we've had a fun, a very fun few days of getting to know one another. Um, the next three days, we will, we will get to also visit with um, local elected community leaders. You'll get to ask them questions. You'll get to visit with our schools and our families and get to engage with them. Um, and some of the most, I think, engaging and important times are also going to be engaging with our tribal councils locally, with some of our cultural organizations, and we're really looking forward to showing you Crescent City, but also having the conversation about where we hope to go. Um, and again, learning where you hope to go. So at this time, is Amy here? Perfect. So at this time, we would just like to take a brief break and out the doors, there is water. Restrooms are out the doors to the hall and to the right. And then we will reconvene in about 10 minutes. Thank you.
We hope everyone enjoyed a brief break. Uh, so one of the things that, that we haven't discussed yet are, is what are the five students doing while we will be talking and having our conversations? So our five students are really engaging in a unique, I think, um, agenda over the next three days of understanding American high schools, of looking at our career and technical education program. They're going to be using laser engravers and CNC machines and engineering and all kinds of things over the next few days. Um, they're gonna be meeting with some of our local leaders, uh, both with the schools and with the community, and talking about how we empower students to make decisions and how we empower students to make changes in our community. Um, and then we'll also be letting them go visit some of our higher education institutions. And they'll be talking about colleges and the, the system of colleges in the United States. Um, but as great as that is, for some of them, the most fun will also be that they will be working with NBC as their film for an Olympics special. So that'll be great. So I think that they'll have some stories to tell at the end of this week. At this time, um, we have someone very special with us who will be working with the Empowering Resilient Women's Group a little later this afternoon. But I would like to introduce Brianon Fraley, who is the Chief Governance Officer for the Talawa Daini Nation, one of our local American Indian tribes. And this is traditional Talawa land. And so, Bri? Uh, Shu Shaninla, Jeff Harris, Shahushi, Brandon, Hoite, Trait, Fraley, Shi, Neely Chundin, Daini, Neshley. I come from the village of Neely Chundin, and I wanted to welcome you to my homeland. So the Talawa name for this um, area is called Ta'atan, and it's within the Ta'atan Yashi. And so for the Talawa Daini people, we have 12 principal districts here within Northern California and Southern Oregon, and we'd like to welcome you to our homeland today. Um, today we have um, present day four federally recognized tribes within this territory, two principally being Talawa um, indigenous peoples and then Yurok indigenous peoples to the south um, in Klamath. And so I just wanted to give thanks to the, the county and the city and the school district for allowing me to come and welcome you to my homelands. And I look forward to speaking with you about women empowerment and resiliency. Um, one anecdotal story that I wanna share with you all today as we move forward in thinking about resiliency and empowerment was, I was asked the question, um, what am I going to talk about to you all today? And for me, I'm a mother of four, and I'm a survivor of a mass genocide. And I was thinking about trauma and how that changes who you are as a person. And for me, if I didn't experience historic traumas of genocide, then I wouldn't be empowered to be the woman I am today to step into a leadership role. Um, so in thinking of welcoming you all here, it is the concept of traveling through time for you all that you recently experienced a mass trauma within your community and you're now just picking up the pieces of your community. And for us as Talawa people, we have experienced those traumas generations ago and we are the future of those traumas. We are resilient and we have overcome barriers and have propelled us as women to take on different roles in our community. Because prior to the genocide here that we experienced from the gold rush, from civilization of uh, manifest destiny of America being established, um, I am a product of those tragedies. And um, I don't think I would be standing here today if, I didn't ex if my family did not experience those things. 
because women played a different role at that time. And over time, we had to empower ourselves, empower the survivors, empower the women. And the women were the glue that kept our families and our communities together. And with that said, I would like to welcome my, um, my wonderful cousin to the stage, Amy Cordalis, to give the keynote address today. I'll probably hand it back over to Jeff Harris. But um, speaking of women empowerment, I admire um, and empower my sister, my cousin, uh, my relative, and all that she does, and I admire her um, her work that she does on behalf of our people, and is a is a model of women empowerment in Delmar County. So shoot, shot Nayla, Amy. And I don't believe there could have been any better introduction. So Amy, please come up. Aqui. Good morning. Uh, Neck now, Amy Cordalis, New Walk Requa, Numate Wa Walk Lao. It's such an honor to be here with you all today, and what a historic moment um, that we have here to gather in Crescent City. Um, there's so much to be thankful for and grateful for. I um, first want to welcome the Japanese delegation. What an honor to be here with you all today. Um, I want to thank the city and the county for the invitation to speak. Um, and I also want to thank the Talawa Dene people for allowing us to be on their land today. Um, I just introduced myself in um, my native language. I'm um, Amy Cordalis. I'm a Yurok tribal member. I um, come from the village of Requa, which is right on the mouth of the Klamath River on the north side. And I think most of you all have been there. Have you guys had the chance to go there yet? Tomorrow, tomorrow. OK, well, this is the perfect introduction then to, to Requa. Um, I currently serve the Yurok tribe as general counsel, so I run the tribe's legal affairs. Uh, the Yurok tribe is the largest tribe in Northern California. Um, we are a federally recognized Indian tribal government, and so that means we have all kinds of rights and privileges to regulate our people and our land on our reservation. Um, but more importantly, it means that we have a really rich heritage here in this area. Um, and I think it's, it's key and really important that as we're here today in this time where we have some esteemed guests as well as the county, um, uh, politicians and others from the city as well as Yurok tribal leaders here and other tribal leaders uh, that we recognized our, our shared uh, our shared experience here in this area and how lucky we are to be from this place. So I also want to say um, I am expecting. I, I'm pregnant and uh, <laughs> um, very excited about that. But also, sometimes with all this going on here, it's like your lungs get a little bit of pressure on them. So sometimes I get a little out of breath. So bear with me as I go through my speech today. Um, I want to start a little bit with um, about my own family and about Yurok culture. 
Um, I am already the mother of two. I have two little boys. Um, one of them is here today, um, sitting with his other aunties. Um, I also have some, some family in the room. My great-grandmother, uh, my great-grandmother, my grandmother, <laughs> Levina Bowers is here. My aunt, Sue Masson, and my other auntie, uh, Janet Wortman, is here today. And I believe you all will have the opportunity to meet with them later this week uh, to learn about their business endeavors in Klamath. Um, our family's been at the mouth of the Klamath River for a very, very long time. Um, we've lived in Requa pretty much since the beginning of time. Um, and that's one of the greatest things I think about being a Yurok person, is having such a deep connection to um, the river, the Klamath River, and to, to Requa. And knowing um, what it is like to have been there through the generations, um, through, through time, and the experiences that my ancestors have shared there. The Yurok people were the first inhabitants of the Klamath River area. Our Aboriginal territory stretched from the mouth of the Klamath River all the way up 45 miles to the village of uh, Wichpec, and then also south down to the coastal areas, down to um, just a little bit south of what is, or excuse me, north of what is currently McKinleyville in the Arcata area. But this was a, a rich territory that had a lot to offer. Our people lived in a good way. Um, the temperate climate here, the bountiful natural resources, the salmon, the elk, the deer, um, all of the ocean foods, which I understand you all enjoy too, um, really allowed us to have a, a rich, deep, um, enjoyable life uh, pre-contact. Also in this area, of course, were the Talawa people who were from where we are here, but then stretched up into the north. Um, and then to the south of your country, there were the Hoopa people and also the Karuk people as you move further up the Klamath River to the east. So this area has a rich, rich um, history of, of Native people who continue to be here and continue to, to, to live and enjoy the natural resources along with the other folks who came in to be later on. I wanted to share a little bit about the Yurok creation story. And one of the themes of my talk today really stems from the creation story. I think about when we talk about recovering from tragedy or rebuilding um, from historical trauma and empowering women and girls and also empowering our communities to be better than we were before, it really starts with the core fundamental value of respecting one another, respecting each other's roles even though they're different, and placing equal value for every role that everyone plays. And the Yurok creation story, as well as um, Yurok culture, has a lot of ways in which that core value is reinforced. And so today, I want to share um, some of those key kind of parts of Yurok culture, but also share a little bit about my own family history and how that's been reinforced throughout our experience. Um, it, I think it's real special that we're here today as sister cities. And so I feel as if we are all relations, right? Um, we all have a shared experience of being from a, a place of water. Um, and kind of going back to my own family's experience, uh, my husband is from the Navajo Nation. Um, have you all heard of the Navajo Nation? Just hands up. The do they know? Where's the interpreter? Do we have an interpreter? Oh, hello! <laughs> um, does it work if I ask them to like raise their hands every now and then? Okay. So, it, do you all know about the Navajo Nation? No? Okay. The Navajo Nation is um, one of the largest groups of Native American people, and their, their territory is in the Southwest. And my husband, uh, he is a member of the Navajo Nation. And one of his clans is um, Twitsoni Bitsui. That's his clan name. So that's who he comes from. And what Twitsoni Bitsui means is grandchild of Big Water. Uh, my son, Keen, over there, his middle name <laughs> is Twitsoni Bitsui because he 
is in fact a grandchild of big water. And in some ways, I feel like all of us in this room also are grandchildren of big water, right? You all come from a coastal community. You've benefited from the natural environment there in the same way that we all have in this room. Um, and I'd like to think that the, the water between us is really just a big lake. <laughs> um, that it's not a huge ocean, it's really just a big lake. And that our shared experience bring us together in a way that we all um, are grandchildren of big water and that we all have that shared ancestry. So to go back to the Yurok creation story, um, it came long, long time ago where the creator came and decided that things needed to be organized. Things needed to be made into a world. And so first the creator made the land and the water and then made the animals and the birds and the plants and all of um, the ecosystems. And lastly, the creator made the men and the women. And Creator told the men and the women um, that all of this would be here to, to provide for you and that you would never want for anything. But you had to live in a balance with the natural environment. You couldn't take too much. If you took too much from it, then the balance would, would fall off guard, right? And so it was really important that while you were able to benefit from the rich natural resources and that you would be provided for, you had to make sure that you did that in a responsible way. And so the Yurok people agreed to that. We agreed to be the stewards of the land. We agreed to only take as much as we needed. And in that way, our livelihood, we would be provided for. And I think this is one of the core kind of values that informs your culture, is that we have a basic respect for life and creation that acknowledge that all creation has a role in making our planet whole. And there's a mutual respect for ecology and the natural world. And that respect carried through to relationships between people and between men and between women. Our society, our traditional society, has specific roles for men and women. Uh, the men tend to be the hunters. They tend to be the fishermen. The women traditionally would gather. They would um, you know, prepare the seaweeds and the acorns, and they would be with the children. But the leaders, as well as the men, were also in leadership roles. There were high families that um, were called dance families that um, were involved in the leadership of the community. And both men and women could be leaders there. Um, the way that you could become a leader was through acquiring uh, Yurok wealth. So things like um, these minks, right? That would be a form of Yurok wealth. Or of these beads, these are clamshells. Um, these are dentelium that I wear, this white shell. Um, and all of this was, um, could be found in the natural environment. And when a Yurok person found some of these things in the natural environment, you would see that as a reward, right? As a reward for living in that way of balance, right? Of being a good person, of only taking as much as you needed in order to support your family from the natural environment. And so the more wealth you acquired, the better you were living. The more um, sort of in your role that the creator intended that you were placed, excuse me, that you were taking, um, and then you would acquire more and more wealth. We also had medicine people, uh, medicine women, who had great powers to heal, right? And people would pay them with different kinds of wealth. And that's how they accumulated more, and their position in society would rise, and that's how they would become head women and head people. But the point in all of that is that these roles of men and women were equally valued and, and equally seen as being important into making all of society grow. We also had great ceremonies um, that took place mostly in, in the summertime that were called world renewal ceremonies. Some of our high dances, we pray for, for that balance that we were talking about in the world. 
Um, we pray that the ecosystems and the humans, that they all live in a way that leads to balance, that leads to equilibrium between men and ecosystems, and that allows us to thrive. We also had brush dances, um, ceremonies where we would pray for sick children, um, and our people would come, and, and I think this is such a beautiful ceremony, and these still happen today. Our people would come, um, and all the tribes would join us. The Talawas would come, the Karuks would come, the Hupas would come, and they'd come to a, to a dance ground, and they would pray and dance and sing for days, um, all for the health of a sick child. And the ceremony was guided by a medicine woman um, who, who would make sure that the medicines and the formulas were done right in order for the baby to heal. And these ceremonies throughout time have had great success in making our people healthy and keeping our babies strong. So there really was, and there continues to be, this strong relationship with with balance and with ex respecting the equal roles of men and women in bringing that balance to society. Um, and beyond just the relationship between men and women, that mutual respect for the natural world and the role, the important role that the natural world plays in keeping that balance was equally valued. And in this way, uh, my ancestors pretty much thrived. Um, they did well. Um, in my own family history, I have Talawa family. My, um, I'm looking to my grandma, great, great, great. She's nodding her head. Yes. <laughs> uh, grandfather was Captain Tom, who was one of the last um, traditional chiefs of the Talawa people. I also have a great, great, great grandmother who came from Karuk territory up the Klamath River who was bought as a bride to come down and join my Rekwa family, my Yurok family. Um, and, and, and it's really special to be, um, to have ancestry from all of the different tribes in this area. And many of the Native people here, they share that same kind of history where there were different marriages of the different tribes through the area. And it really brings us together in a cohesive way uh, where we get to continue our cultures um, and share those with the other Native people in this area. But my family always lived in Requa, at the mouth of the river. Uh, we have a home place there that my grandmother's house is still at. Uh, but my great, great, or my great grandmother's house, which was her ancestors' home, was just across the street from um, where my grandmother's house is now, and that's where we've always been. Um, we had a very strong connection to that area and also to the Klamath River. Um, to our culture and to our ceremonies and our family. And through the years, it, it's meant any, everything to us. One of my favorite family stories um, was about the first time um, my ancestors from Requa ever saw non-native people. So the way the story was told to me was that in the 1700s, Russian sailors uh, came into the Klamath River estuary. And um, they were, of course, in a, a Russian sailboat. And they um, were big, bigger than Yurok's. They had white skin, which Yurok people had never seen. And they were really, really hairy. <laughs> they were covered in hair, um, all on their faces, on their hands. Um, and they had been at sea for, you know, goodness knows how long, but they had white little bugs going all through their beards and eyebrows. And you can just imagine the shock of the Yurok people, right? Um, Yuroks are small in stature. Um, we, you know, have browner skin and brown hair, and we don't have a lot of facial hair or body hair. And so to see these tall, you know, pale, 
men covered with hair and bugs going through it all must have been quite shocking. I kind of think of it in modern culture, kind of modern pop culture is like, um, do you guys know about Star Wars? Yeah, Star Wars, okay. P uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, does that sound familiar? Well, some of us do. So just imagine if the Ewoks from Star Wars were to meet the Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> That's kind of what I envision <laughs> this encounter to have been like in the 1700s. But the way the story was told is that the Ewoks wouldn't let the Russian sailors off of the boat. Um, and I think that was probably for good reasons with all of the diseases and bugs that they were carrying. Um, so apparently how the interaction was is that the sailors stayed on the boat and, um, you know, they, some Yurok men would come out in their redwood dugout canoes and kind of check them out. There was no violence as far as I'm told. Um, but eventually, apparently the Russian sailors kind of cleaned up and the Yurok's agreed that they would wash some of their clothes. <laughs> and so they did that. They washed their clothes and I think they exchanged some food, um, maybe some other kind of trade items, which is really neat because now in our old, old regalia, we have Russian trade beads um, on our old, old regalia. Um, and those trade beads are like little red and blue beads. Um, so it's kind of neat to think that those beads came from these in initial interactions. But eventually the, the Russian sailors left and went on. Um, that's really one of my favorite stories, which I think is such a neat one for um, all of us here in this area. Uh, through the 1800s, my family experienced um, genocide, assimilation. Um, as the United States government came west, um, the United States basically sanctioned and made it legal to kill Indians, um, to, well, to take land through all means necessary. Um, I think one thing that protected my family from being annihilated in that time was just the remoteness of this area. Um, the gold rush in California in the mid-1800s uh, brought all kinds of people into California, especially into the southern and to the central areas. But here, we were protected by fog, right? <laughs> uh, we were protected by remote, rural, rugged landscape. Um, when you go to Klamath, you'll see how um, you know, you'll go through the redwood trees to get there and then you'll get to the river and you'll notice how it's just the river here and then um, not big mountains, but, you know, hills that come up um, with big trees. And that made accessing our territory in the 1800s really, really difficult in a lot of ways that protected us from, from more influx of non-native people at that time. But in that time, my family survived um, in a lot of ways. Um, one of the things that is, I think, also kind of funny is, you know, we continued to live our traditional way of life of living from salmon in the river. And really through the 1800s and even into the 1900s, the federal government made it illegal for Indians to fish on the Klamath River. And so to survive, my family became salmon bootleggers. Now, that may not make sense to <laughs> the Japanese delegation, but, um, you know, I kind of uh, equivalent our... Um, selling of salmon illegally to the same way that alcohol was sold during Prohibition. Um, but we were salmon bootleggers and we continued to, to make our living um, and to feed our families um, based on how we always had done. Um, and we were able to stay on our, our traditional homelands in our, our family's home. During that time, we had land both at Requa, but then also up at Brooks Riffle, um, which is about, what would you say, six miles up the river from Requa. Um, and in the 1900s, the early 1900s, that's when the family also create, or built a cabin up there and started a bit of, of a homestead up there, I guess you could call it. Um, 
But this was an important time for my family. In 1906, my uh, great-grandmother, Geneva Matz, was born. And she lived in such an interesting time uh, from the 1900s until the 2000s where this area went through a great, great change. Um, she was born in a traditional Yurok redwood plank house. She lived in that house for some time. She was taught her language. She was taught her culture. She was training to be a medicine woman. Um, so she really knew the, the ways of, of the old people, the ways of our Yurok traditional lands and cultures and all of it. Um, but in the, the um, I think it was probably the 1915s, 20s era, um, she was taken to boarding school up in Salem, Oregon, to Ch uh, Chimawa boarding school. Um, and there she was taught how to keep house, right? Um, in the United States or in the United States during that time, a lot of Indian children were taken away from their homes and sent to boarding schools. Um, a lot of culture was lost during that time and the children there weren't treated well. Um, it was a, a traumatic experience for a lot of native children. And I, the way that I've heard my great-grandmother talked about it was that it was hard, but she also learned a lot of um, good values about how to make different foods, how to take care of a house, how to kind of manage a house. And she took those parts of it um, and helped and used those to help that um, or to help her in her life later on. Um, she also lived in an interesting time in, um, in Klamath when she came home. So the town of Klamath in the 30s, 40s, 50s was really quite a, a bump in place to be. <laughs> there were um, lots of restaurants, there was a theater, there was a car dealership. Um, as I understand, there were dance halls kind of all over the town, and so people would come and they would dance and they would go to the restaurants. Um, and when, have you guys been to Klamath yet? They go tomorrow? Okay, so remember this when you go to Klamath and you see what it is now. But um, in that time, it really was a, a poppin' exciting place. And a lot of people came here for the river, right? And for the salmon industry, also for the logging industry. So there was economy based on the natural resource. There was money to be made here. And so a lot of people came to the area for that purpose. Well. My great-grandmother, um, as I'm told, happened to meet her husband um, one day um, dancing in one of these dance halls, and that started their great love affair. Um, and they ended up having 10 children. Uh, they lived between Requa and Brooks Riffle for um, all of their life. Um, and what I'm told is that Great Grandma, you know, really did pull from those skills she learned at the the um, boarding schools in um, running a tight home. She worked hard all of the time. Um, they were the kind of people that um, lived off the land, right? They made all of their food. They had cattle. They had chickens. They hunted. They fished. They had beautiful gardens full of vegetables. They had an orchard, um, and they would can their foods. They would preserve their food so that they could survive through the winter and feed their families. Um, as I understand, she really did stress education to her children and making sure that her kids had access to education. Um, my grandma tells me that at some point, her and her brothers and sisters had to take a boat down the, the Klamath River from um, Brooks Riffle to Requa and then catch a car or bus to go into Crescent City to go to school. Um, and I can only ma imagine the journey and how long <laughs> that would have taken every day to get to school. But it really just demonstrates the commitment that they had to, to get an education. Um, some of the other stories that I think are really important to share is um, they always said to make sure that 
you presented yourself in a good way, that you had clean clothes, that you ironed your clothes, that you look people in the eye when you talk to them, when you shake their hands. Um, and one of the great stories I love from my great-grandfather, Emery Matz, is that he would always say, when you walk into job interviews, um, you keep your hands out of your pockets and you show you're ready to work. Um, and you always have a strong handshake. But the two of them, they really passed down this, um, a strong work ethic, a strong educational ethic, and a strong core value to be proud of who we were as Indian people. Um, and they taught my grandmother, and, um, which she has passed down, Yurok culture, right? She taught us about that core uh, cultural value, about the creation story, about the importance of living in a balance with the natural world and with each other. And this was really unique because this was a time when um, Indian people were experiencing a lot of discrimination um, and a lot of people at that time were not proud to be Yurok. They weren't proud to be Indian. Um, but she saw that that would pass and that it is important as a family value that we understood who we are as people and that we understood our relationship to the creator and also to the natural world. She had a lot of successes in her life. Um, one of the things that um, really has informed my life is um, her, my family's Supreme Court case, which the Supreme Court in the United States is our highest court in the land. So my family's Supreme Court case, Matz versus Arnett, uh, reaffirmed the boundaries of the Yurok Reservation and that we had uh, uh, federally, excuse me, federally reserved rights, including water rights and fishing rights. Um, and there's really an amazing story behind how that um, court case came together. In the early 1900s, the state of California believed that Yurok country, uh, so basically the lower Klamath River, even though it had been set aside as an Indian reservation in 1855, was no longer Indian country. And because it was no longer Indian country, that meant that state law, California law, applied and that Indians didn't have any right to fish there um, based on their Yurok ancestry. And so how that played out was that basically the state and the federal government wouldn't allow Yurok people to fish on the river. You can imagine the great disruption this was to families like mine who for generations had uh, made their living, fed their families based off fishing on the river. Well, apparently one day, uh, well, I shouldn't say just one day, there were several occasions in which my great-grandmother would tell her sons and her daughters to go fish on the river. Doesn't matter what's going to happen, just go fish. If you get caught, you get caught. Um, and that's what happened. They fished, and then the state would arrest them, and there was this pattern of the state arresting them the family would appear in court, the judge would say, pay a dollar and I'll give you your nets back, and then they would go on. And that's how it went for a long time. Well, finally, in one of these court cases, my great uncle, uh, supported by my great grandparents, basically said, I'm not paying a dollar, and this is my right, and I will continue to fish. And I'm going to pursue my case as far as I have to, to prove that I have a right to fish on the Klamath River. And so that's what he did. Uh, with the help of what became the California Indian Legal Services, which was a nonprofit legal services for Native Americans, the family pursued a court case all the way to the Supreme Court. And in 1973, the Supreme Court handed down the decision that reaffirmed that the Yurok Reservation was still Indian country and that we still had fishing rights. And also that we were still a, a, an Indian community. Um, and that really led to the beginning of the organization of the Yurok tribe as a modern tribal government. It also led to the assertion of um, the Yurok fishing right, uh, which my aunt Sue 
would go and, and work towards advancing. But she, my great-grandmother and great-grandfather really had a key role in moving that along and supporting that. So in her life, she experienced a lot of successes and saw things, but she also saw a lot of hardships. Um, she had 10 children, and, and almost half of those she lost when they were young um, from diseases or car or logging accidents. Um, and we had a great uncle, or excuse me, an uncle who passed in World War II. Also, in 1964, there was a massive flood in, uh, on the Klamath River. And that flood pretty much wiped out the whole town of Klamath. Um, all of the dance halls and the restaurants and the car dealerships uh, were just washed away. Um, for my family, we lost our cabin up the river, our home place up the river, where the family had all of its orchards and its animals and its uh, vegetable garden. It was just all gone. At that point, there was no insurance. There was nothing to help the family rebuild. It was just gone. So I imagine that in that moment, she, she had lost so much. Um, you know, she had lost several of her children by that time. She had lost her home. Um, she was seeing the change in the, the community around her culture. She saw the discrimination. And I, I'm sure she struggled in that moment. And I imagine that in that moment, it, it perhaps is similar to what you all experienced with the great earthquake in 2011. Sort of this moment of, I've lost so much, and how do I carry on? How do we find the strength to, to move forward when we're experiencing so much grief and sadness and loss? And how do we make our way out of tragedy? <clears throat> I share that history in this story because in those moments, I find inspiration from my great-grandmother. Despite all of her losses, she persevered. She stayed positive and she worked hard. And I know she found happiness and meaning in her life. Her legacy was her family, inspiring her family and her community to love to be grounded in culture and place and the core values which she embraced so tightly. Reflecting on her experience, I think about how tragedy informed her life and how we can all use tragedy to inform how we move forward. I think sometimes we have to struggle with tragedy to feel the enormity and gravity of love because love is what keeps us together. We are all endowed with the love of our Creator, and we don't have to do anything extraordinary to be loved. We are all repairers of creation, and we all have the inherent power to bring love and joy and peace to this world. And we know this to be true when we think about the way people who have loved and helped us along the way. I think it's important to take time in our hard moments to think about these people. Some of, them are, some of those people are here with us. Some of them are gone. Some of them are no longer with us. But deep down, you still benefit from the ways in which they have always helped you and the ways in which you know that they always wanted the best for you. And I think it's important to, to draw on this power, to understand that we all have the power to love and to support one another in this same way. And we can use that power to rise from tragedy and build, rebuild our, way, our worlds in ways that's better than before. My great-grandmother understood this, and she taught us to live this way. I think this message is particularly relevant to this group because of our shared experience with tragedy, the great earthquake, the tsunamis, historical traumas that have impacted our community so deeply. There was extreme loss and we will never be the same. But now through partnerships like this and also through expanding our mind and, and relying on people in new ways, there's new love, there's new growth there is shared uh, partnership between two nations, two peoples separated by what I like to call the big lake, 
uh, your friendship, the love that grows between the two of you will expose you to new ideas, uh, new culture, new economic structures, new roles of women and men that will result in a world that will be better than before. This is the most powerful of partnerships. It is a worthy effort, and I applaud you for devoting your energy in this way. As we heal from tragedy and rebuild our nations, we must take advantage of all that there is to help us. We can no longer allow discrimination, bias, or differences in gender or race to divide us. We can leave no one behind. We must accept and empower each other. We have the great privilege of being the beneficiary of the Creator's great plan. We have an obligation to rebuild and to live better than before. And we must do this in a, a, a way of balance with the natural world and each other. We must honor the power in each creature, each species, each man and woman, by giving them each equal value. Celebrating diversity through inclusion of all of us leads to a more balanced society, one in which each is acknowledged and empowered to play its own special part in creation. This makes us stronger because creation is used in the way that the creator intended. In this way, we can all be our best selves. We can offer our lives to our highest calling. Empowerment. So empowerment comes from honoring the power in each creature, each species, each man and woman, by giving them each equal value and creating a safe society in which they have the privilege to exercise personal sovereignty, which is critical to advancing from our historical traumas and rebuilding. While things like education, mentorship, equal opportunity, all helps empower our communities, including women, they can't do it alone. Women empowerment really does come from a society value that equally recognizes the important roles that we all play here. I earlier shared your cultural values related to this because I think it's a great example of how this can manifest itself. I've also been the beneficiary of how that kind of core respect for creation and living in a balance with the natural world and with each other can benefit um, a person. My family had the, the uh, <laughs> great insight to support us and to love us in this way, and they allowed us to live that way. I benefited from being connected to the Klamath River. I benefited from being from a family full of love. And I have to share a fishing story, because if I didn't, I, I would just wouldn't be doing it justice. <laughs> but I wanted to share one that talked about how connection to place and to uh, my role as a Yurok person has empowered me to, to build confidence. Um, when I was about 21, 22, I was home um, from college. I um, was working for the Yurok Tribal Fisheries Department as a fish technician, and I um, was off on a weekend, and it was fishing season, and the fish were running, and I went down to the mouth of the Klamath with my gill net and my rowboat, and it was just me. Usually you have a fishing partner, and that, that's the important piece of this, is that usually when you go down, you have a fishing partner, but for whatever reason, this time I didn't, and so it was just me. So I put my fish in the, or my net in the water, and bam, the fish started hitting. And before I knew it, in a matter of probably 15 or so minutes, um, I had ran the net five or six times, and I had over 30 fish, all gigantic big salmon um, that I had managed to get into the boat, um, get cleaned, all by myself. And I'm not a large woman. <laughs> so this was quite a physical feat. Um, but in this story, I learned that I could go out there and I could catch fish and I could support myself if I needed to. And in that moment, I had a lot of confidence that I can do this, 
right? That I, I can take part in my role as a Europe person. I can fish. Um, I can provide for myself and for my family. I, in this moment, had expressed my own personal sovereignty and had a created a better understanding of my role as a Yurok person here. And that was empowering. Um, and it helped me build confidence that I later then took into law school, into various bar exams, to, and that, well, to the Native American Rights Fund where I worked, uh, which is uh, the oldest and le or largest legal defense fund for Indian tribes in the country. Um, and that's confidence that I carry into my uh, current position. It's not an absolute confidence, but it's definitely one that gets me in the door, and then usually a strong prayer gets me the rest of the way. <laughs> um, so I guess I share that um, we have a lot to learn from our shared histories. We have a lot to learn from our traditional cultures. And I think the value of coming from a diverse community like we have here, um, and also welcoming in our neighbors who also share their own strong cultural values, provides us an opportunity to learn from others. Um, and when we expand our minds and when we can approach that partnership with an equal level of value to each and every person and acknowledge that we all bring our own ordained role from the creator, our own special set of skills, that's empowerment. Um, that's how we expand our partnerships. That's how we heal um, from tragedy. So I think Yurok is a great example of how we've been able to do that uh, within our own tribal government. Um, you know, there were folks like me who benefited from um, a strong cultural upbringing, other Yurok families who have since come home and worked for the tribe. Um, and we've made great strides since, since, well, over the last 100 years. Um, really in organizing our people and trying to create a society that shares those values, right? That core value of, of balance and equal, equality, excuse me. And in that, while we've, we've had some hiccups, we certainly also have had great successes um, where we've had women leaders. Uh, for example, my aunt Susan was one of the first tribal chair people. Uh, she was also one of the first, I think it was the second woman in history to be the president of the National Congress of Native Americans, which is the national organization, advocacy organization for Native American peoples. So we've been able to have leaders both locally but then also nationally. We also try to um, really rely on that constant, well, excuse me, on that core value of balance and equality in the way that we conduct our business affairs and our governmental relationships. And in that way, we work to build a society that has those equal values, that carries forward those traditional notions into modern times to continue to express our sovereignty in a way that is culturally consistent. So I hope that um, today you've learned a little bit more about the native peoples of this area um, and how we are using our traditional values to inform who we are today and to, to really expand our partnerships um, to be able to support everyone. I want to share uh, one last story and a song. Um, in Yurok, we pray for everything. <laughs> we prayed in the bathroom before we came in here. <laughs> um, but we pray for everything. Um, and, and prayer, in a lot of ways, is a way to set an intention, right? Um, and I don't think you have to be a religious person to be a spiritual person to acknowledge the power of intention in, in informing our lives and decisions. Yurok did this with almost everything they did. Um, and I'd like today to share uh, my great-grandmother's medicine song. This was a song that um, has gone down through the family, and it's a song about healing. It's a song about um, intention of bringing people together and to rebuilding, to rebuild. So I hope that um, 
well, I guess I would ask you that while I sing it, that you open your heart um, and that you set a good intention for this partnership. You set a good intention for working with others with an open heart um, and one that allows us to learn from a diverse group of people while we rebuild our communities. Um, so I'm going to ask my sister to come up with um, a couple tools. Also in Yurok, we have um, what we call root. It's a, um, did you get the, oh, I have that. Um, so root is, um, it's Angelica root. And it is um, one of our, our roots that we use, one of our forms of medicine that we use um, during our prayers and our ceremonies. We won't, it won't. Um, and this, does this look familiar? Do you guys, ha yeah, abalone. Yeah, so this is an abalone shell. A lot of times when we uh, burn root or other medicines, we'll do it in an abalone shell. So when we burn root, the, the smoke helps carry the prayers up to our ancestors. So while I sing this song, we're going to um, burn the root and send the prayers to the ancestors. Did you, oh, good, you got it. Oh, 
Thank you, everyone. I wanted to offer this abalone shell and this root to the Japanese delegation to um, express our um, love and support for all of you and for this partnership um, and so that you may have a piece of us that um, we hope you'll continue to use to, to cleanse yourself, to protect yourself, and to carry your prayers to your ancestors and creator. Wakalao. Thank you. So. So thank you, Amy. We really appreciate it. It was a great introduction to our area and what they'll be experiencing this week. So thank you. So as we move to the next phase, I would like to introduce you to four people who will be very important to you over the next three days. Um, since she stood up first, we'll introduce her first, Lisa Howard. Lisa is the wife of Chris Howard. Lisa is um, in our county office the coordinator for our MTSS program, our Multi-Tiered Systems of Support program. Behind Lisa in the green sweater is Nick LaFazio. Um, Nick is the coordinator for our county office for behavioral supports. And then sitting next to Nick is Taryn Musbach. And Taryn is our county office coordinator for uh, PBIS, Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports and for um, uh, climate and, and trauma-informed practices. Um, the other person that you'll get to know very well this week is Holly Went, And Holly is working with Heidi and Lori on the Empowering Resilient Women. So Holly, at this time, if you'd like to come up, we're going to hand the next interactive session over to Holly. And I think this is going to get us up moving a little bit. Konnichiwa and welcome. So we're really excited to take this opportunity to introduce some amazing young people in our community. This group has been around for several years, but it wouldn't be possible without some collaboration from different community partners. And it first started with United Indian Health Services receiving funding to work on suicide prevention in our community. They provided a training to community partners who would like to work with youth to develop, to develop sources of strength. And when that happened, the Department of Health and Human Services through the county assisted in doing a training. And one of the amazing people that attended that training 
was Kelly Troina, who is a teacher at Sunset High School. So for several years, these partners have been working together to find ways to increase the sources of strength in young people's lives in our community. They focus on eight powerful places that youth need to assess and develop skills to be resilient in life. That's family support, positive friends, mentors, mental wellness, having access to medical services, spirituality, generosity, and healthy activities. And so we're really excited to have 14 amazing high schoolers who are going to get you up and moving in a few minutes. But if Kelly, you could come down, please welcome Kelly Troina. Konnichiwa. <laughs> welcome. I'm coming this morning straight from Sunset High School. Sunset High School is the second high school that we have in Del Norte County, and it's a very small high school. We have about 90 students enrolled right now, and all of the students who have enrolled at our school have enrolled for a reason. Some of them suffered trauma when they were younger. Some of them simply want a smaller place, with stronger relationships with to teachers. Some of them have felt bullying or other forms of trauma on other school sites. And so they come to Sunset, where Holly introduced us to a program called Sources of Strength. The power behind Sources of Strength is not the adults, even though we wouldn't have it without these powerful community partners. The power behind sources of strength is the commitment that these youth have made to be there for each other, period. The community love this program so much. The high schoolers love this program so much. We have taken this nationwide program and turned it into a mentoring program where these amazing high schoolers take time out of their life and education to go and teach these skills to middle schoolers in Crescent City. So not only do they work inside their own school, but they take it and teach the middle schoolers how to be peer leaders in their school, and those peer leaders will help their friends in the middle school. Oftentimes, when we raise the issue of trauma, or we talk about suicide prevention, we mention the negative. We mention what we've survived. Sources of strength flips that. And we focus on the positive. What do we have to help us overcome? What strengths do I have that make me strong today? What strengths do you have that add to our community? And that abundance of strength and positivity has changed our school community because of the ways that these youth have chosen to emphasize what they have instead of what they're still developing or what they've survived. They want to focus on everything they have and they can use to overcome whatever is in front of them. So in this program, we ask high schoolers to be risk takers, to take a risk, to practice standing up and doing something that makes them uncomfortable, and to move outside of what they normally do. And we're going to ask you all to do the same thing. <laughs> we're going to ask you to think about what are things that are your sources of strength. And we're not going to be able to do that with language. We're going to have to do that with art and drawing. And we're going to have to be, take a risk, and we're going to have to be as creative as we can. And if we're not very creative and artistic, we can try. When we draw images of our strengths, 
The picture becomes more beautiful with each image that each person adds. So my question is, what are your sources of strength? What helps you endure when times are challenging? One source of strength for me is my family. I value my relationship with my husband and my children, and they help me whenever I have a hard time. What are your sources of strength? Before we ask you to get into groups, I'd like to introduce you to the 14 amazing young people who've joined us here today. Go ahead and come up here. They're a little shy. Thank you for giving them a big round of applause because these 14 high schoolers are taking a big risk stepping off their campus to meet you today and to share something that really matters to them. There you go. You got to introduce it. Hello, my name is Lori. Hello, my name is Owen Proctor. Hello, my name is Justin Chaw. Hello, my name is Sage Wilson. Hello, my name is Gabriel Deckard. Hello, my name is Andy Clark. Hello, my name is Eric Quintes. Hello, my name is Isaiah Sherman. Hello, my name is Dylan Sargent. Hello, my name is Miranda Webb. Hello, my name is Blaze Smith. Hello, my name is Sierra Oscar. Hello, my name is Aiden Corpovalis. Hello, my name is Tanea. So real quick, um, the woman who just walked in is, if you could just turn around and wave, Wendy Rinkle from United Indian Health Services. She is the reason why these young people are here. She's the one that started it in Del Norte County for us. So she's an amazing woman who's brought an amazing program to all of us. So real quickly, we're going to ask you to get up. We're going to have our peer leaders will be in groups of two. And we're going to ask you to think for a minute about what gives you strength. When we do this activity, I usually draw music notes because for some reason music and dancing always makes me feel better, right? It's a healthy activity that makes me feel well. So just briefly, I'm going to go over eight categories that you can possibly use in your drawing. Family support, positive friends, mentors, healthy activities, mental wellness, health care, spirituality, and generosity. So we're going to ask you to divide yourselves up. And all of our guests, if you would like to participate in this as well, this activity is called What Gives You Strength? And we'll be giving you posters. The, the high schoolers may be taking their group out and up the hall. You may be going around the corner. You may be walking someplace to work on this as a group. And you're going to draw, take turns drawing what gives you strength. What did we bring for the people who draw the most on their posters today? What did we bring for them? T-shirts. We have prizes. <laughs> After we get done, we'll ask you all to come back in here. And those of you who would like to can come up and share your beautiful artwork. All right? Kelly, how long are we going to give them to draw? Mm, probably 10 minutes. So we'll give you about 10 to 15 minutes to draw. That's a break. Move around, engage with your group, and then we'll meet back in here.